Hello, good morning. Uh, so we were talking about sort of the natural carbon cycle. And, uh, and we sort of framed it in terms of uh, the atmosphere is sort of the grand central station of, of the carbon cycle. Because the other, uh, the other reservoirs of carbon, uh, which include the land surface, And the ocean and the solid earth they all sort of interact with each other uh, by way of the atmosphere so the atmosphere is kind of like the grand central station of the carbon cycle everything kind of comes and goes through that And so let's see. The solid Earth kind of breathes to the atmosphere. That's the the uh, the weathering CO2 thermostat that kind of stabilizes the climate of the Earth on very long time scales of sort of half a million years, something like that. Uh, the land biosphere. We saw the traces of that sort of breathing on an annual cycle when we looked at uh, the movies of the CO2 concentration measurements in the atmosphere. In the northern hemisphere, in particular, is where the land is. And so there is this amazing seasonal cycle of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So the, the trees grow in the spring and the summer, and they take up carbon dioxide to make their leaves or whatever. And then the leaves fall and decompose in the winter. And so then that carbon goes back into the atmosphere. So the, the biosphere sort of inhales in the summer and exhales in the winter. And then there's the ocean, which is sort of a, a third set of lungs in, the, in the, the carbon cycle. And the ocean was responsible for the glacial, interglacial cycles of atmospheric CO2. So on time scales that are shorter than the solid Earth kind of calls the shots, there's this kind of oscillation, this, this unstable kind of cycle of the ice ages you know, the ice growing and melting, and then the, uh, the CO2 concentration sort of going up and down. So three sets of lungs all breathing to the atmosphere, not really interacting directly with each other, but, but, but via, via the atmosphere. And so the trick now is to uh, talk about fossil fuels. And, and we'll think about what happens when we get sort of take carbon out of the solid earth in the form of fossil fuels and put them into the atmosphere, sort of where does it where does it uh, make this whole thing go? And the first thing we need to talk about to sort of add to our picture before we can, you know, before we can do this is to talk about how much carbon there actually exists in these various reservoirs. So um, the, you know, if we're talking about all the carbon in the world, that's a lot of carbon. Uh, and so there's this kind of a, a, a unit that, that gets used, uh, gigatons of carbon. A, a giga means 10 to the ninth. And a ton is, uh, this is a metric ton, so this is uh, a thousand kilograms is a metric ton. An English ton is, is 2,000 pounds, something like that. So they're slightly different. A kilogram is like 2.2 pounds. So uh, a metric ton is a slightly different unit than, a, than an English ton. So uh, the units that people use to talk about carbon in the carbon cycle, how much there is, are, are in these units of gigatons of carbon. So to start with, the atmosphere, which is the, you know, the clearinghouse for everything, there are about 600 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere as, as carbon dioxide. Now, you may wonder whether you need to remember that number exactly. Uh, I would say no. But uh, what I want you to take away from this is um, uh, a, a knowledge of which of these things are bigger than which other ones. And then we're going to talk about how much fossil fuel there is. And we're going to do that in gigatons, too. So 
which fossil fuels are the most abundant and how do they compare with the, you know, the other parts of the carbon cycle. So, uh, you know, the numbers, you know, the, the, the absolute numbers, 600, zero, zero, is not, you know, perfectly accurate. I don't care if you remember that. I'm not going to ask you 600 or 650 in the atmosphere or something like that. But you should be aware of which, the whole point is, which of these reservoirs are bigger than which. So the atmosphere has about 600 gigatons of carbon. That sounds like a lot of carbon, but actually, if uh, you were to somehow, by magic, change the, the, uh, the phase diagram for CO2 so that all of a sudden it starts to snow out as dry ice, uh, and you made all the CO2 in the atmosphere rain down or snow down to the surface and accumulate, uh, it would only be a layer about this thick, about 10 centimeters thick. So it's not really all that much carbon in the atmosphere uh, as all of that. It doesn't, I mean, looking straight up, there's only 10 centimeters of snow over my head of, of CO2. That's not very much when you compare it to, uh, you know, the size of a gas tank full of carbon or whatever. Okay, so that's the atmosphere. The land biosphere, the trees, the stuff that's living, the living biosphere is about <coughs> another 500 gigatons of carbon. So that's the trees and the grasses and things like that. There's also carbon that is uh, stored in soils. So these are like dead leaves that haven't decomposed yet. and uh, there's actually more of that than there is the living stuff. There's about 1,500 gigatons of carbon in the soils. So that's kind of a dicey number a little bit in that it's not all that easy to define exactly how much organic carbon there is in soils because, you know, by saying soils, you're sort of saying the part of the, the, the surface of the earth that might respond to changes in climate. So, you know, carbon that might degrade or something. You know, if you dig 50 feet down in the ground, there may still be organic carbon there, but you sort of say that's kind of out of place. So how, how uh, deeply you're willing to call soil is, it, it, it determines how much of this soil carbon there is in, 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 in the world. So the 1,500 gigaton number comes from uh, assuming a soil depth of about a meter and a half, something like that. So, you know, five feet maybe. So there's more carbon in the biosphere on land than there is in the atmosphere. If you were to cut down all the trees and burn them right now and, you know, don't mess around with the soil, but just the trees, you could just about double the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere if, if you did it, like, all at once. The ocean it turns out is a much larger uh, carbon reservoir. There's about 38,000 gigatons of carbon dissolved in the oceans. So that's about 40 or 50 times as much as in the atmosphere. So that's a, that's a heavy hitter. That's why the ocean can drive the CO2 concentration up and down through the glacial interglacial cycles. And we'll also see that ultimately the fate of most of the fossil fuel CO2 will be to dissolve in the oceans. There's a lot more carbon dissolved in the ocean than there is in the atmosphere. And we'll talk more about the chemistry of that uh, in, in a coming lecture. But then the really heavy hitter is, you know, where most of the carbon on Earth is found is in the solid Earth. So that's, you know, in contrast to our sister planet Venus where most of the carbon is in the atmosphere and just, you know, cooking the hell out of that planet on Earth because of the, the Uri reaction that, uh, you know, weathering tries to take carbon and put it into calcium carbonate, that's where most of the carbon on Earth is. So rather than write a number in gigatons, which is just a huge number, I'll just say that 99% of all carbon on Earth is in the solid Earth. Yeah. Uh, the the land is sort of the surface, the land surface. So it it includes the soils down to about a meter and a half or something like that. It's stuff that's kind of interacting with the climate and the and the and, and the atmosphere, you know, on some reasonably short time scale. Whereas 
solid earth, we're talking about uh, you know, kilometers thick uh, sedimentary rocks, uh, which are mostly on, on land, but some in the ocean. And uh, when carbon actually gets uh, subducted in the form of calcium carbonate down into the solid earth, then you can actually have carbon down in the, the interior of the earth, sort of the mantle. So that's the distinction between those two. Uh, so now uh, we have some context to talk about the fossil fuels. Uh, of this carbon that's in the solid earth, uh, Something like 20% of it is uh, organic carbon. So we talked about last time that means it is chemically uh, reduced as opposed to oxidized, like CO2 or calcium carbonate are both oxidized forms of carbon. Uh, and then the other 80% is calcium carbonate. So the, the reduced carbon that's buried in the atmosphere, we also said, is the source of the oxygen in the atmosphere. So we may not, uh, you know, intrinsically, first thing in the morning when the alarm clock wakes you up and you'd rather stay asleep, you may not really care that the, there's all this organic carbon in the, the solid earth, you know, but every time you inhale, that gives you a reason to care because that's why there's that's why there's oxygen in the air, and so Lovelock called the the this the bio, the, the battery of the biosphere, the oxygen in the atmosphere, and the organic carbon that's that's buried in in uh, in, in the solid earth. But we also said last time that uh, most of the carbon, by far the vast majority of the organic carbon that's buried in the earth, Lovelock's battery is in an inconvenient form. We can't use it as a fossil fuel. So the fossil fuels, there are three main types. There's coal, coal there's oil, and there's natural gas. Uh, and we're going to sort of um, contrast these, you know, compare them with each other and sort of put together the big picture first and then we're going to talk about each of them kind of in turn, you know, what the story is behind them, where they come from and, 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 and all that. So um, coal, it turns out, is the, the, the heavy hitter. There's much more, there's like 50 times more coal than there is oil or gas in terms of carbon. So the numbers, again, are a little bit uncertain because they sort of depend on, you know, future discoveries and, and changes in mining technology and, and stuff like that. Uh, but for what it's worth, the estimate for coal is something like 5,000 gigatons of carbon as coal that might ultimately be available. So, you know, there's factor of two sort of disagreement in this because it's not, you know, a number that's real precisely knowable at this point. But, but that's kind of the scale of it. Uh, oil and gas both have something like 100 gigatons of carbon each in the traditionally defined, you know, uh, commercially exploitable oil and gas deposits. Now, there are some sort of almost kind of oil deposits. There's things like uh, oil shales and, and tar sands and things like that. And uh, if you start adding those to the oil reservoir, you might get maybe another 500 gigatons, perhaps, something like that. There's a lot more of that. The Canadians have a lot of this oil this, this tar sand stuff that they're talking about uh, processing. And uh, in terms of the natural gas, we need to be a little careful about, I mean, you know, you say gas, like in the context of a gas station, you think about oil. When I say gas in here, I'm talking about uh, natural gas, which is methane mostly. Uh, and 
So there's something like 100 gigatons of, of the traditionally defined gas reservoirs on Earth. But then there's other sort of non-traditional forms of methane on Earth. In particular, there's something called uh, hydrates, methane hydrates. So these are um, peculiar sort of water ice crystals. Water H2O has this, this uh, ability to freeze into sort of soccer ball cages, as opposed to just normal ice like in ice cubes in your freezer. This is a different crystal structure. They form these sort of uh, soccer ball sorts of things. And they need to have a gas molecule on the inside in order to make it stable. And it doesn't really have to be any particular kind of gas. It can be anything as long as it's sort of the right size. So there are uh, CO2 hydrates probably on Mars, maybe under the ice caps. And it turns out that on Earth, there's lots of this methane that's frozen into these hydrate deposits. And they're located in the, the sediments at sort of on, on the, the, the edges of the oceans, sort of near shore sediments of the oceans. And there is something like thousands of gigatons of methane as this, as this, this peculiar form of hydrate. So there are uh, ambitions and efforts to try to figure out how to mine this stuff. The Japanese, in particular, are very interested because there are hydrate deposits off of Japan. But the Japanese don't have any other sort of traditional fossil fuels. Uh, India is, is, is you know, trying to figure out how to, how to harvest this stuff. Uh, and there's also a potential sort of climate feedback that ultimately these could release methane on their own. If you know, they're frozen now, they might thaw. So we'll talk about that at some point in, in the future. But uh, so of the traditional stuff, coal is the heavy hitter. And there's you know, like 10 times almost as much coal in the Earth as the CO2 in the atmosphere. So if you took all the coal and evaporated it instantaneously, you could increase the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere by like a factor of eight or something. It's a lot of carbon there. Whereas there's not as much of the oil or the gas. So you know, one really strong bottom line we can take out of this is that the big decision in terms of you know, global warming and, and preventing it or not preventing it isn't really whether we drive fuel efficient cars or not right now. Because there's only so much oil in the ground and there's not really enough to totally torch the planet. The big question is whether we burn all that coal or not. Because the oil, by the end of the century, is going to be gone. That's kind of like a given almost. Uh, so you know, people are attached to their automobiles as fashion statement or you know, a little refuge from the world or whatever. And uh, uh, I personally tired of fighting about you know, fuel efficient cars because I figure the, the oil is already gone. The big question is the coal. And nobody's all that attached to a coal fired power plant. I mean, let's face it, they're just, they're just sort of, you know, they would be expensive to replace, but not that expensive. And you know, it doesn't reflect on our own sort of self images. So, so coal is kind of the big, the big, the big question. So uh, let's start out let's look at a figure from uh, the text. There we are. Uh, this shows how these different forms of energy are used around the world at various different places. So um, these are pi diagrams. So you know, the bigger the slice, the bigger the percentage. And um, for the globe overall, we have, uh, let's see, the, the, this part in the upper right, that's, that's petroleum. Uh, down here is natural gas, and, and, and this one, the, the gray one, is coal. And so you see that you know, it's about sort of equally divided. The, the carbon is sort of, there's you know, some coming from all of these sources uh, today. And then we can look at the United States. And because the United States is such a heavy hitter in terms of our energy usage and carbon emissions, the globe looks a lot like us. So the, the United States is actually responsible for about 25% of the of, of the globe. And so 
You know, the globe kind of looks like us uh, in part just because we sort of dominate. But also, I guess we have sort of a, you know, an average kind of energy usage pattern. But there are differences around the world. I mean, there, there's this, these, these patterns aren't written in stone, and it's very possible to change you know, a, a, a country's energy usage. So France is an example. Uh, France, uh, a few decades ago, decided to invest heavily in nuclear energy. And so they've got all these nuclear plants now, and, and they get a fairly large fraction of their energy, you know, not quite half. From, from nuclear. So they're kind of oddball in that regard. Uh, Danes have invested heavily in wind power. So these figures are a few years out of date. Um, uh, so wind power comes in as renewables, which is this little sort of 10% slice here. So the story I heard about Danish wind power is that they actually generate about twice as much as they can actually use because Wind power is sort of intermittent, and so there's a problem with storing energy if you get it from a windmill because it's, you know, it's probably not coming in exactly when you want it. So something like half of their electricity that they generate from wind, they sell to the Germans because you know, they can't use it right exactly when it, when it comes in. Uh, China and India are both, they're sort of developing world, and they have uh, a stronger dependence on coal than, than, the, than the world in, in general. Brazil has a uh, uh, where do they have? Maybe it's this. No, that's well. They have a lot of hydroelectric power. I guess that was the point of this part, this pie chart for for Brazil. They also grow uh, biofuels from sugar sugar beets, I guess, in Brazil. The sun is very bright in the tropics, and so you can get more energy out of agriculture. We try to make ethanol out of corn in this country, and it takes as much gasoline to make the ethanol as you know, the ethanol is worth. So it's, you know, it's sort of a, a, a farm subsidy thing. It's not really a CO2 thing in this country. But in Brazil, the, 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 uh, uh, the biofuels is act actually sort of makes sense. What are the various forms of fossil fuel used for uh, is shown in this, this other figure from the text. Coal is almost entirely used to generate electricity. You know, so like in the cowboy movies, they would use it to drive, uh, uh, you know, uh, steam engines, like train engines. So you'd see the conductor in there shoveling coal. They don't do that anymore. Coal is not such a, you know, convenient form of energy for transportation or for, you know, they don't use coal to heat individual houses anymore. Old houses around Hyde Park have coal chutes in them a lot of times in the basement that you could buy coal. They would dump a load and you would use it, shovel it into your furnace all winter. They don't do that anymore. So coal is almost entirely now used for electricity. Oil is used uh, mostly for transportation. So that's this, this sector here, and that's because it's incredibly convenient as a way of carrying energy around. It's much more energy per pound than you know, any batteries that they've been able to develop yet. So a car driving on gasoline can go for 300 something miles before you have to refill. And if anybody wanted to drive 600 miles in their car before they refilled, I'm sure you could fit a bigger gas tank in a car. But uh, you couldn't possibly do that with, with batteries at this point because the energy density is not as high. And then uh, there are. There's, um, you know, another alternative is to use uh, methane to drive with. Um, so sometimes you see uh, buses that say this bus runs on clean natural gas. That means that they've got a, uh, uh, a tank in there that can, the trouble with methane is that it's a gas. And so to hold very much of it, you have to compress it because gases like to expand. Liquids like oil just sit there in a tank. You don't have to have them under much pressure. So uh, the the buses that use natural gas have to have some kind of a heavy tank to hold the natural gas. And so it's not as convenient for transportation either. It actually burns cleaner. That's why they call it clean natural gas on the sides of buses. It's a nice PR thing. But um, so natural gas, you can see, is used for uh, kind of a variety of things. They, they, um, they produce electricity from it. So there's gas-fired power plants. Uh, there's a lot of industrial uses. Some, some 
Uh, I guess transportation is just that little sliver here. And then, um, so, so there's, there's, there's producing electricity mostly from natural gas or from, uh, or from, uh, from oil. If we look at electricity, no, not oil, coal. So electricity is the little zigzaggy lines here. So coal and natural gas are the main ways that, that electricity is generated. And once it's generated, how does it get used? Uh, it's sort of used in sort of equally in, in different sectors of uh, the economy. Uh, electricity is used for residential, like we use it. It's used for uh, commercial, like, like shopping malls and stuff like that, and, and in industry. And they're sort of, they're sort of equal. So uh, another bottom line that we'll come to is that CO2 emissions come from uh, all different sectors of the economy. So we can't just change the way that factories work or shopping malls or homes or cars or whatever and solve the whole problem. They, they talk about a portfolio of solutions or wedges. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that sometime uh, by the end of the quarter. But uh, the bottom line is that you know, CO2 is used for a lot of different things. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the different forms of fossil fuel, kind of where they come from. I mean, in general, they all come from photosynthesis. They all are, are uh, energy from sunlight that has been stored in the chemical bonds of reduced carbon and left behind oxygen in the air. Um, so it's like fossil sunlight. It's like fossil solar energy is, is where the energy comes from. But uh, in particular, for coal, coal is, is um, essentially it's uh, cooked fossil peat which is um, sort of leaves or moss sort of preserved in a swamp. So there's, there's, uh, there's sort of two different kinds of coal. Uh, coal from freshwater, freshwater swamps end up with uh, coal that has not very much sulfur in it, which is the good stuff, low sulfur coal. Whereas uh, swamps that were sort of saltwater swamps have more sulfur in them. And so when you burn that kind of coal, either you have to scrub the, the sulfur out of the, the, the exhaust, the, the smokestack before you release it, or the um, sulfur produces aerosols, little, little droplets of sulfuric acid that we talked about. And these tend to, tend, tend to cool the planet. or at least cool the region that, that they're released in. Because they, they scatter sunlight, and so they increase the albedo of the Earth. And they also have this, we talked about this indirect effect, that they make the cloud droplets be smaller than they would have been. And smaller cloud droplets are better at scattering also. So actually, it turns out that the indirect effect from making the cloud droplets is probably even bigger than the direct effect from the aerosols. But it's, it's not very well known because it's hard to know exactly how big the cloud droplets would be if you know, the air was, was totally clean. And then so after the sulfur sort of floats around and mucks around with the climate for a few weeks, it uh, dissolves in rainwater and rains out as acid rain. So uh, 
So the low sulfur coal is, is much preferable because you don't have to clean up uh, as much uh, as, as high sulfur coal. Um, so the way that that coal is used for energy is kind of crude, actually. So you, uh, the, the coal is mostly actually elemental carbon. So we could sort of write it as carbon. And it gets uh, burned with oxygen to make CO2 plus heat. And the heat is used to boil water. So you boil the water, and then the, the steam drives a turbine. So some sort of a propeller thing that then goes around and around and, 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 and uh, goes to a generator in order to make electricity. So you boil the water, it makes the steam, the steam expands. And you, when it expands, you push it past a propeller, like a jet engine has, has a, a, a turbine in it. It looks a lot like that. So you push, and it, and it turns the propeller and generates electricity. Um, there's actually uh, an alternative way of dealing with coal called gasification. Coal-fired uh, plant does this. Uh, coal gasification. Uh, you start out with the carbon from the coal, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's reduced carbon. If it's just elemental carbon, the oxidation state is zero because there's no charge and there's no hydrogens or oxygens to give up or take off any electrons. So CO2, you remember the oxidation state is uh, plus 4 because the oxygens each are great greedy for two electrons, and 2 times 2 is 4, and the overall charge is 0, so the carbon has to be plus 4. <coughs> so the carbon is going from 0 to plus 4 here. Um, and so you can get the energy out of it by just burning it. But an alternative is to uh, take the reduced carbon and react it with water to make reduced hydrogen. So hydrogen gas and carbon monoxide, CO. So those gases are both reduced relative to what they would like to be in oxygen. So it's like you've transferred the reducing power from the carbon to these other gases, the hydrogen and the carbon monoxide. So they used to do this a lot in, in Victorian England to make lighting gas. They called this town gas. It's astonishing to me that they would use carbon monoxide to, make, uh, to, to burn lights with, because carbon monoxide is extremely poisonous. It'll kill you. I've got a, a colleague, actually a guy who works on carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide from his faulty oven just about killed him one Thanksgiving. He came very close. Uh, so it seems like a real hazard to me to have this carbon monoxide going around. Anyway, point is, now the reduced stuff is in the gas form instead of in this powdered form. And the gas form you can put directly into a turbine. So these reduced gases <coughs> they burn in a turbine directly to generate electricity. Uh, so the analog would be, if you want to do this with coal, taking some powdered coal and throwing it into the jet engine and burning it in the engine. But the powdered coal is like sand or something. So all that powdered stuff would, would gum up the works. You, couldn't, you can't throw it into a, 
a turbine. You have to burn it and make steam and then run the steam through the turbine. So you take these reduced gases, the town gases, and, uh, and burn them in a turbine. And then the heat from, you know, after it goes through the turbine and generates electricity once, you've still got this heat. And then the heat uh, boils water going to another turbine. So you get uh, about twice the energy from it. It's a much more efficient way of getting energy from the coal. It also uh, produces a, a, a stream of pure CO2, which can be captured and stored. So there's uh, an idea called uh, carbon capture and sequestration, CCS, which is a big deal in trying to plan for you know a future that that doesn't include uh, you know melting down the climate. Uh, pretty much all the plans that people have come up with that could you know reasonably do this include the idea of capturing CO2 from power plants and then injecting it down into the earth someplace to kind of you know, get rid of it instead of putting it in the atmosphere or putting it in the ocean or something like that. And uh, doing this gasification results in a stream of pure CO2, which is kind of more convenient to capture than in a uh, coal-fired plant. You're burning the, uh, the, the, the coal with, with oxygen that's in the air. You could burn the coal in pure oxygen, and then you would get pure CO2 out. But that burns so hot, it's kind of impractical. And so they burn it in air. And so what comes out is uh, something like 80% nitrogen, which is what's in the air. And then the CO2 is maybe 10% or something. So you have to separate out the CO2 from that, that, that stream, and it's kind of harder to do that. So they can retrofit coal-fired power plants to capture the CO2 to, to sequester. But uh, if you're going to actually capture the carbon, it turns out to be worth the extra trouble of doing this, this step to gasify, because it's easier to, take, to capture a pure CO2 stream than to separate out the 10% CO2. So, um, and then the other, the other uh, benefits of gasification is it uh, prevents uh, release of uh, sulfur, which you know makes the aerosols and the acid rain. So you kind of get that for free. And then also is 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 it prevents uh, the release of mercury. So mercury is a terrible element as far as we're concerned. It, it, we, we release it, and it um, cycles around in the biosphere for a long period of time. So the mercury levels in lakes and, and in soils uh, are sort of building up. And the um, uh, place where it impacts us actually is, is fish. So especially fish that are very high in the food chain, like tuna or swordfish or shark or something like that. You know, these are like five levels up the food chain. Every level up, the mercury gets concentrated. So, you know, the, the fish supply is, is sort of getting, uh, getting kind of poisoned by, by this mercury. If you eat too, too much fish, you'll, 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 uh, you'll, you'll dose yourself. So that's kind of the story on coal. Uh, there was actually plan to build one of these gasification plants. It was called FutureGen. It was going to be here in Illinois. And it got canceled uh, a few years back. And I don't know, you know what the status of that is now. Oil is uh, uh, the, the next form of, of, of fossil fuels. And uh, Oil comes, so, so, so coal comes from, uh, from 
dead plants, you know, land plants that are preserved in, in these peat deposits. So, you know, think swamp and, 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 and you know, disgusting black, muddy, gooey, uh, smelly mud that, that sort of accumulates over years and years and years. That's, that's, that's peat. Oil is produced from phytoplankton. In, in the ocean. Um, the, the structure of oil is, uh, is a long chain, is long chains of carbon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This particular uh, chain of carbon has eight uh, carbons in it. And so this is octane. So, um, the different lengths of the chains burn with different properties in your engine, and so you know they 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 tune the the mixture, and they they call it an octane number because you know the ratio of octane to some other uh, some other uh, compound uh, sort of tells you how how the gas will burn in your car. So. You know, you, you get the cheap stuff is low octane, and the, and the more expensive stuff is higher octane. Uh, these chains are mostly uh, saturated. That means that there's as many uh, atoms on them as possible. No double, double bonds, only single bonds. So there's hydrogens such that every carbon gets four bonds like that. Um, and oil, as we've seen, is extremely uh, convenient for transportation because it's this liquid that is very easy to carry it around. So um, there's a book I can recommend to you if any of you are interested in sort of the geopolitics of oil and, and how, how oil has, has uh, shaped the last century or so. It's called The Prize by a guy named uh, Daniel Jurgen. So he tells about how Churchill made the decision to run their, the, their navy on uh, oil instead of coal, I guess, early on, like around the First World War, I guess. And it was kind of a Faustian bargain because they had lots of coal. They've sort of run out of coal, the Brits have now, but at the time they had a lot. And so they were then beholden to, they were vulnerable to supplies of oil, but it just makes the machinery of, <coughs> I guess warfare much more effective to run on oil, and so then the Second World War was all about uh, capturing oil supplies, and the, the Germans were trying to produce uh, oil, and you know the Battle of the Bulge and the One Bridge Too Far, all those old movies. You can you can see about how oil was sort of a critical thing, and then you know more recent history may have something to do with with oil as well. I guess you can judge for yourself. The book, uh, the prize is it's it's thicker than than it. You know I don't like books that are like this thick. I always think that a, a good book should be sort of, you know, should be sort of m moderate size. The, the, the prize is sort of like three times as long as you really want it to be. But the guy knows everything about, about uh, the history of oil. And it's very, very, it's sort of like uh, the way I first heard it described was you're watching some soap opera and all of a sudden it becomes revealed that somebody has this double life and they've been responsible for everything that's been going on for like this last two years of the soap opera. It's like this oh my gosh moment. It's sort of that way with oil. It's, it, it, he makes the case that it's sort of this sort of backdoor, you know, prime mover in, in, in geopolitical uh, uh, history. So there's not much oil on Earth, and that's because it takes really special conditions to make oil. It doesn't happen all that much. So uh, the most sediments contain not very much organic carbon sort of less than 1% by weight organic carbon. 
And those sediments are useless for making oil. What you need is you need uh, uh, source rocks that are higher in organic carbon. High carbon source rocks. And these tend to be found in relatively thin, very distinct layers. So the whole Saudi Arabian oil field, which is you know some huge fraction of the total oil on the earth, derives from this one little layer of rock, which is just a few <coughs> meters thick. So you know there'll be uh, not very much carbon above and below, and then there will be high carbon just in this this one black stripe of, of rocks. And it's thought to have something to do maybe with uh, whether there was oxygen in the water where the, the plankton were, were, were landing. So if there's no oxygen, then the carbon can get preserved more effectively rather than getting, getting respired before it gets buried. So these source rocks are pretty rare. And then, and then uh, they have to be cooked Uh, and there's a, a, a particular um, depth range in the earth where the temperatures are good for making oil uh, called the oil window. This is a depth of 7 to 15 kilometers in the earth. And if the, the source rocks are buried too deeply, then, then it all gets turned into natural gas. It's not oil anymore. And if it's not deeply enough, then it sort of stays as sort of tar. So those tar sands that the Canadians are talking about, you know, they're, they're like not quite ripe. They're not quite mature. But there's this, this depth range in the sediment where it's, it's good enough that the chemistry happens to make oil. And then the oil has to move. It has to, you know, we can't get it if it's all spread out. So the oil has to be able to migrate. And then it's got to get caught in a trap. So there's some kind of a permeable rocks down here that the oil can squeeze through little holes, you know, like in between sand grains or something. And then an impermeable layer. that 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 catches it and traps it and then you build the oil well and, 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 and dig into there and get it out. So I imagine that probably the vast majority of oil that has ever been produced on Earth didn't get trapped, but it just escaped all the way to the surface and and you know was lost, got 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 oxidized eventually, or else it stayed down there for, for long periods of time and, 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 and never never concentrated to the point where we could uh, use it get it. So as a result, the uh, here's uh, a plot of where the oil is on Earth. And just by the statistics of small numbers, you know, if it doesn't happen very often, you know, it's not going to be spread out very evenly because it's so rare. And for that reason, there tend, you know, most of the oil uh, on Earth is found in the Middle East, a situation that you've no doubt, you know, you're already aware. Okay, so we'll continue this on Friday.